This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Uh, We've taken a long break. We've all been out on a bunch of trips, conferences, uh, but we are back in studio to continue talking about the firestorms. Right, Randall? Is that where we're going to, is that where we're going this week? I thought we would perhaps get a wrap on that one. Get a wrap on it. Because there's some, some interesting details we haven't gotten to yet that, um, Some interesting questions to raise, um, unresolved issues, mysteries, that sort of thing. Excellent. We'll be back. (laughs) Brad's still on the road. I thought we had it all figured out. (laughs) Um, Some serious clues last time, but uh, that's not been released yet. So, yeah. So we're... As of this recording, then there is one more recording we've done that has not been released. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, then, well, it will be more released surprises. before this before is released. This is, that's so right. that I Unless... can go ahead and speak uh, with the assumption that people who are watching this episode have watched the previous one. Or at least are able to watch the previous one, yeah. Okay. They're sequential yeah. type folks. That's well, right. if I hear about anybody watching this episode without watching the previous one, I'm going to be really upset. <laughs> just just kick them out of the audience, Randall. <laughs> you can't listen You're anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, been a lot of uh, a lot of time spent on the road in April. Absolutely, and more to come. More to come. Yeah, that's that's uh the next one's going to be pretty exciting, though. I'm looking forward to getting back into Montana. Yeah. How long has it been since you were in Montana? Well, Brad, three, four years. Oh, well, okay. let's see. Probably with our tour across the country with Graham, right? Well, you've been out since then. I've been out more recently than you have, I think. But yeah, a couple of years, two, two for me, maybe years. four for you. Okay. We did not get into Canada on our trips with jerome lessman right no uh well we got into canada but not montana that was 2017 That's what I meant, but montana. yeah we had we had ed nightingale and uh some people with us in uh 2015 for sure we went into montana and then up into bc um uh, yeah that yeah. might be the last time for you i know i've been out there since then though okay because i went i went through there after scablands last year though i had the covid so i just sat on the edge of flathead lake for three days wishing I had the energy to do something. (laughs) Well, yeah, so that trip, we're going to be headed into the lake basin. And I'll put quotation marks around the word lake. But, uh, yeah, Yeah, we'll be spending basically a week going, uh, starting at Pend I think the first we gather in Sandpoint, Am I right there? Sandpoint, Idaho. No, we're actually we're actually going all the way up to Bonner's Ferry, but we'll go through Sandpoint. Uh, okay, day going one, to Bonner's Spokane, and uh, yeah, head head north up the Purcell Trench. Okay, so are we going to route through the Kootenay River Valley? Oh yeah. Okay, so yeah, we will probably be day two. Ooh, so we'll be making a stop at Kootenay Falls. The falls. Yep. Oh man, there's something about that place. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, we're going to give us some time to do that around Kootenay Falls, too, not just be a rush job and get in and get out. But, yeah, we'll have time to explore around there. Yeah, it's, oh, uh, wonderful. Yeah, really broad uh, area of falls. So, yeah, with 45 of us, we'll take some time to look around. Yeah, you know, there's an arm of the lake there that I don't think that it extends north off of uh, Clark Fork that I don't think we've ever explored. Um. So maybe we'll get a chance to on this particular trip. So the idea here is, you know, we've divided the trip by using the Purcell trench lobe uh, of the ice, which was the ice dam 
So one side of the ice dam takes us to the scab lands and the other side of the ice dam takes us into the, into the basin of the glacial lake. So that seems like a very logical place to divide the, uh, the tours, unless you were going to do two weeks, because it would take really two weeks to, and you really even that's not enough because if you're going to include, you're going to have the full tour of the whole suite of features, you got to include the Columbia Gorge and the falls down there. And yeah, the overlooks, the, all of that. Yeah. You have to include that. So when we were there in Washington, uh, last month, we made it as far south as Wallula Gap, but we weren't able to get up on top of the gap, which I would have liked to have done. But it was windy that day. Oh, man. Cold and windy. So. They had a good alternative site prepared, though, so that'll be a unique view for the uh, yeah the, the secret series that's coming up. It September. will, and I think, Brad, we got a long distance shot of you up there, poised on the edge of one of the sisters. Well, I hope that makes it in there. I went over there on purpose. Yeah, I hope it makes it in there too. Like we're down there, and somebody goes, "Hey, look, there's somebody up there on uh, up on one of the sisters." And I look up there, and I go, "Yeah, profile looks somewhat familiar." Shiny cranium. It looks the shiny. Well, that's Brad-like. what it was. It was the glint. <laughs> The rays of sun breaking through the clouds and glinting off of Brad's. <laughs> and that's the first time I've ever been over there. You know, we've been there half a dozen times at least, and that's the first time I actually got up there. But, you know, there's there's trails, and there's, mm-hmm. there's the ability to walk around, and there's actually a huge rope, a huge steel rope. No, it's not holding the thing together. It's actually something to grab onto so ah. you feel safe because it's only like a foot and a half wide, you know, walkway to get around it in some places. So, aha. Uh-huh. Yep, that was me over there. If that shows up in the series, I was like, "Well, this might be my only chance." At stardom. <laughs> well, I'll, I will say that you made a good scale man. Yeah, I have a lot of practice at that. Goal achieved. So yeah, that that was good. We'll have further announcements to make on that. Uh, the specific of what we were doing there, and uh, remember, mute that part, Brad. Bleep bleepity bleep 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 uh yeah but then uh you know hanging out at the soap lake resort and seeing uh the plans that uh that the new owners have for that place is really really interesting you know they're going ahead you remember the uh the place where we had breakfast in the mornings yeah well that's all gutted out that's going to be rebuilt back was that where the new restaurant's going I That's think right. so, yeah. yeah. So, or at least so, the dining the dining area. Yeah, the kitchen's kind of in between the bistro and the restaurant area. Yeah. So hopefully that'll be good to go by September. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. They won't have the new 40-unit conference center finished, but that's okay. But that's coming. Fantastic. And a spa. So if we're doing future... Tr- tours out of there uh people have access to a spa fully um fully outfitted spa with a sauna of course the saunas are already there yeah there's some saunas outside the beach house yeah we usually stay yeah that are there for the uh for the guests right that's going to expand though yeah all the accommodations Mm -hmm. the the cabins the spa area the the, there'd be a pool area there'd be yeah, all kinds of new amenities to to draw people in for a, a wellness center and uh, excellent expanding the use of the mineral waters from Soap Lake. Yeah, and uh, we'll be able to uh, use that as our base camp for future Scabland tours. It's going to be awesome. Fantastic. Yep. So, contact at the cabin dot com, randallcarlson dot com. If you guys want to sign up, check That's it right. out. Two trips late September. That's so you right. got about four or five months to make your plans and uh yeah, join us. It's dramatic and awesome. It is. And uh a few more spots left in Montana. One spot, I think. Yeah. One spot. Yeah. One spot max. Yeah, we may we may have had that filled today by one of our uh, uh friends that's gone on both the Cumberland trips with us. So yeah, that 
may be covered. Right. But yeah, there always seems to be a little flux. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate to get yourself on the list. There may be some changes in, That's the, right. in the last few weeks. You may still get in. So That's right. Contact at cabin.com, like, like Russ said. I wonder links, if we're going to be are always in the video description, so I put those things there. Quick are we going to be able to get in any uh, hot springs? Soaking in any hot springs? In, uh, on, in the Montana trip? Montana, yeah, there's some good ones there. Hmm. Especially well, Quinn's, the- Quinn seems to be out, but you and I can talk about that. Yeah, we're going okay. to massage the itinerary a little bit, and that, that seems like a requirement to me. Mm, yeah, I like that. Well, I, right. you know, that one place we stayed... Um, Oh, they're in, just in um, Pine Lone, Lone Pine, near Hot, the town of Hot Springs. Well, yeah, it's actually Hot Springs name itself, but yeah, Lone Pine is is nearby in that uh, little Bitterroot Valley. And, and as an extra added draw, if we stop there by the, those sulfur muds, maybe Russ can go in there and wallow around and get covered in head to foot with um, smelly mud. Oh yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I know cool. you will. That's why I. <laughs> Dude, we can have a smelly mud fight. Yes. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Like sulfur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sulfur wrestling. Sulfur mud. <laughs> sulfur mud. Wrestling in the sulfur mud. Yeah. <laughs> sulfur mud wrestling. I was really yeah, enjoying it. You know, it's the. Uh, oh, I don't know which. I forget which tribe it was. One of the old elders of the tribe was the caretaker there. Right. And I think it was like, I don't know, you gave him five bucks or something. He let you go in there and. You know, I'm thinking, oh man, this is great. You know, and you really that mud, you know, it's it it does feel good, and it's hot. That mud is hot, but um, I'll do it. it sounds well. There's leaves and mud, and yeah, you stand there holding onto a wooden frame, and your body, you know, neck deep in there. So yeah, it, it is an odd feeling, but yeah, you can scoop it up, lather yourself up with it, dry out. Well, who were we with? Um, yeah, one. I think one of our team members did that. That's another Mike. Yeah. Yeah, another Mike. Not. Silent mic, but uh, a different yeah, mic. Not silent mic or how to mic or any of the. No, other neither of those two mics. But, mic. but uh, yeah, if a uh, normal guy Mike comes on a trip with us, that might actually be mandatory. What to duck me in the mud? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is this kind of a, kind of a geological baptism? Is that right? Yeah. You've got Mike, to become we, a bog body, Mike. We've. We have actually discussed your case, Mike, and we have decided that really we are going to try to spend more time getting you out of your comfort zone. So I appreciate the thought. Because secretly, we've basically had a just a no. is that <laughs> a, a, a year or two down the road, like when Mike is there, you know, looking like, you know, his hair is out to here and he's got a look at he's got a beard. Look at there. He does. Yeah. He's, so yeah um we go you remember remember that guy the normal guy mike you, you used to be <laughs> yeah back in the day i remember there used to be people that you just took them you called them straight people that was before <laughs> being straight had anything to do with your your sexual orientation it right. meant you had either turned on and you know drank the uh, electric kool-aid or you hadn't so um <laughs> I was, I've always been kind of straight and, and I've never been cool. I mean, I just, I can't well, help it. That's why. A right. sulfur mud bath will change all of that, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Instantaneous that's... coolness. Instantaneous awesomeness. Zigzag. <laughs> okay. So we got to do that. We got to have a pick. Of course, Mike won't be there. So we'll have to have a stand in candidate. Yeah. Here is, here is russ after he's just emerged from the mud <laughs> the smelly mud pit that's right i think that would be um a oh, classic yeah yeah you can do it yeah but there is uh right there it's a little town called hot springs it's right there in lone pine just north of the uh oh uh, yeah just north of camas prairie i was trying to remember the the ridge of east west oriented hills across that separates lone oh. pine from Marco the, Pass over there. Yeah, the Marco Hills. Yeah, the Marco Hills, I call. Yeah, yep. so that's going to be cool. We're going to have the... Um, we'll we come that and create some wild moments. Yeah, we come down through Marco Pass, and that's always one of my favorites, is when you come through that pass, and you've got Camas Prairie, 10 miles basin of Camas Prairie, opening oh. up between the mountains. 
And you see that as you're coming through the pass, the, the road makes a, a sharp left turn and there's a pull off right there. And it's a great vantage point. You just see the, the huge ripple train just disappearing off into the distance. And, um, yeah, we need to time it so we're there at uh, low sun angle because yeah, that's exactly. when you really, yep. Yep. wow, when you see that. And it's a perspective you get on a ripple train that you don't really get with West Bar. As impressive as West Bar is, we've never actually gotten down on West Bar itself. No, right. That's a multi-hour trek. I've looked. That's a multi-hour trek, yeah. yeah for sure. But with Camas Prairie... It's right there. You're right you at the top right of it, the, at ground level, looking yep. down the down the slope, and uh, it's just displayed right there, un unmistakable, unambiguous. And uh, and then you can look on the up on the mountainsides, and you can see the shorelines, the ancient shorelines. And so when you look at the the ripple train and the shorelines, those two things alone, wow, this was a mega scale hydraulic event that happened here that shaped this landscape so yeah so that's only a few of the spectacular features we're going to see out in montana then this trip is basically full but again you know get on the list and then you'll be priority for the one we're going to do in the spring probably may mm -hmm. uh, we'll repeat the montana part part one or part two however you want to look at it as the as the scab lands ice age floods tour pairing uh, mm -hmm. but yeah let's not uh dally too long on that uh, i yeah. know we want to get into the firestorm cosmic firestorms and try to wrap that one up we've got a uh, probably six seven episodes into that yeah well it's a hell of a story so yeah let's get into that and and we'll talk here for a minute about um here well we, we should probably just do a little bit of a recap um we talked about um you know, a, a number of storms. Um, we began with the Marim Miramichi, the Miramichi fire of, uh, what was the year again? 1825. 1825, yeah. In New Brunswick, which is still considered to have been probably the most large-scale savage forest fire in Canadian, modern Canadian history. Um. But there was not, you know, because of the, uh, the the lapse of time since the early 1800s, we don't have the same kinds of accounts as we do, for example, the Chicago fire or the um, Peshtigo fire. We talked a little bit about the, um, the Manistee fire, which was across uh, Lake Michigan from Peshtigo. We didn't talk much about the Lake Huron fire because there's, uh, there's not a lot of information on that, but it was also a gigantic catastrophic uh, forest fire that occurred on that same October 8, 1871 evening. There was four, at least four massive fire outbreaks. You had Peshtigo, which is the most destructive in terms of human life, but then the Manistee was actually a much greater area. I think the area of the Manistee fire was something like double that of uh, Peshtigo. But there were not nearly the number of fatalities there. There was um, probably counted in the dozens rather than the hundreds. Maybe maybe more than 100. I don't remember the specific details. But it was a couple of lumber camps that disappeared in the conflagration. And I think this roughly the same thing with the Huron fire. And then, of course, there's lots of documentation and details about the Chicago fire, obviously. But the interesting thing about those particular four fires, October 8th, 1871, Sunday evening, you had this simultaneous outbreak of these massive fires, which included the most devastating in terms of, of mortality figures, uh, forest fire in American history, which was the Peshtigo fire, uh, with the uh, most severe urban fire, which was the Great Chicago Fire. And we found out what was interesting about those is when you pinpoint the ignition time, it they basically appear to be almost simultaneous. Um, that um, And that was right around 9 o'clock. So um, then we talked about the Hinckley Fire and... 
So very interesting things about the Hinkley fire. And, and one of the things about the Hinkley fire was that it, it like the Peshtigo fire, it was one of a suite of fires. It wasn't an isolated event. And this was um, from the book, and I think I uh, gave this quote, but I'm going to give it again because this is such an important factor that's associated with these fires here that it's it's worth um, reiterating here. <clears throat> this is from Stuart H. Holbrook, Burning an Empire, the Story of American Forest Fires. So on September 1st, while fire was sweeping eastern Minnesota in the so-called Hinkley disaster, other fires began belching out of the Wisconsin forest for 120 miles north and south and extending in places as much as 50 miles east and west. This staggering series of fires began just as if they had been the result of carefully planted incendiary mines strung out across all northwest Wisconsin to be touched off by a master switch simultaneously. Now that to me is a very interesting scenario. And we find that associated with these Hinkley fires of September 1st in uh, 1882. Was it 82? Um, and the forest fires of October 8th, 1871. Same, same thing reported. It was almost as if they were all set off by a master switch simultaneously. Now, to me, that fact in one case might be, you could say, okay, this is just a, you know, some coincidental set of meteorological or atmospheric or, or, uh, climatological events but we got it twice, the same thing happening. And that to me is really almost like demanding that we take a deeper look. So um, then we, we proceeded to find out, I showed you that, um, and I'll pull this one back up again. Um, we found out this. Selected meteor streams with data. And we found that there is a meteor stream, the Draconids, whose comet source is Giacobini Zinner. Giacobini Zinner. And it peaks between October 7th and the 9th. Its radiant is in the head of Draco the dragon. So we proposed a rather radical notion here that perhaps that had something to do with it. And we also backing up again, we learned some other things. We learned that um, had that when Hayao Kitaki came through in 1996, um, here's the journal Science. It came out on May 31st. And the article title is Hayao Kitaki Produces Another surprise. When Comet Hayukitaki sped past Earth last March, it did more than put on a breathtaking show. It also delivered a series of scientific surprises, beginning with the first X-rays ever detected from a comet. Now, as a paper in this issue reports, the surprises are continuing with a revelation about Hayukitaki's composition that is hard to reconcile with standard explanations of how comets originated. In this case, says Michael DeSanti, an astronomer at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., in this case, surprise is more than a mild understatement. It was serendipity. DeSanti and his colleagues report that Hayukitaki contains abundant ethane and methane, never before confirmed in comets. The ethane was a shock because astronomers had assumed it wasn't present in the primordial cloud of material that gave rise to the solar system. Ethane can also be a product of a hydrogen atom 
addition re- of hydrogen atom addition reactions on grain surfaces in interstellar dense cloud cores. Acetylene, which is C2H2, is readily produced by gas phase ion molecule chemistry there and after condensing onto grain surfaces can undergo hydrogenation until becoming saturated. A detection of C2H2 or acetylene has been reported in in Hayukataki at an abundance of 0.1 to 0.4% relative to H2O. That's a lot of acetylene. So we've got abundant, the point of this is we've got abundant flammable gases in the nucleus of Hayukataki. That's one of the main things to take away that we learned from Hayukataki is that comet nuclei can contain abundant amounts, concentrations of flammable gases, methane, ethane, and acetylene. And we recall one of the earlier speculations as to the um, as to the um, cause of the fires. You know, we had this was the letter to the Marinette Wisconsin Star, uh, Wisconsin Star of October fourteenth, nineteen twenty one, where they're speculating about the uh, the causes of the Peshtigo fire. Um, so this was on October twelfth in the commemoration of the, well, this would have been the 50-year commemoration. Uh, The editor of the Eagle Star said, I was, wrote, I was much interested in the article in a recent issue of the Eagle Star by the Reverend Mr. Geyer in regard to the Peshtigo fire of 1871. I have a very vivid recollection of the conditions in the eastern portion of northern Wisconsin during that period, but the fire at Peshtigo and also at Hinkley, Minnesota, were no ordinary forest fires, as anyone who witnessed them will concede. What interested me most in the Reverend Gentleman's article was his account of the peculiar freaks of the fire. The Honorable Isaac Stevenson, in his book of Recollections, also gives an interesting description of some of the antics of the Peshtigo fire, such as, some people living through it while others burned to ashes within 10 feet of them. Others found dead without a mark of fire on them. The melting of the heavy iron tongue of the fire engine without scorching the paint on wood two feet away. Mr. Geyer states that at times the very atmosphere seemed to be on fire And at Hinkley, Minnesota, it was said that huge balls of fire rolled across a lake one-fourth of a mile wide. Again, quoting Mr. Stevenson, he says that after the Peshtigo fire, several of our scientific university men spent some time investigating, trying to determine the cause of these freaks. But so far as he knew, never came to any reasonable solution of the matter. In speaking of the fire, I have heard my father, Albert H. Backman, advance a theory which may have, still it seems a reasonable and quite a natural one, and that is, what made the atmosphere seem to be on fire at Peshtigo and balls of fire roll across the lake at Hinkley was burning gas? The question naturally arises, where did it come from? Those who came through the fire will tell of how they could smell, even taste the gas for days previous to the conflagration. Um, So then we're going to um, the history of Chicago from the earliest period to the present time in three volumes by A.T. Andreas, published in 1885. And this is their... um, their take on it. Uh, so, um, ascribing some of those freaks to the to the work of electricity, the agency to which every mystery is generally for, referred when we fail to assign any other cause, it is true that electric fires were vividly at work during that terrible or turmoil of the elements. 
for we know that no chemical change can occur without the evolution of electrical energy. But the electricity itself was only a phenomenon resulting from the formation of other chemical compounds than the one above referred to. Immense quantities of water were licked up by the flames both in city and country and converted into superheated vapor. At this point, the chemical affinities of its constituent gases for each other were overcome by the omnipresent carbon, three pounds of which is combined with every pound weight of hydrogen, hydrogen to form what is known as light carbureted hydrogen, which was just what their terminology was for methane gas. While the released oxygen combined with other portions of carbon to form carbonic acid, this carbureted hydrogen is the terror of the coal miner, forming explosive mixtures with the ordinary air of the coal pit. It is also known as marsh gas, marsh gas, being produced by the putrefaction of vegetable matter under water and mud. The volume of this gas was the material that, mingling with the ordinary air, changed it into a perfect atmosphere of fire through which the intangible flames could leap like the lightning flash from one point to another far distant. Here was the substance of those mysterious balloon masses. They were aggregations of this gas which could not burn where they originated owing to a lack of oxygen, which had already been sucked out from the air by the incandescent carbon. Those masses swept along till they met with a sufficient quantity of fresh oxygen to satisfy their insatiate craving to be reduced back to carbonic acid and water. That condition fulfilled the change, was at once affected, and in the process, the devastating flames were kindled, kindled afresh in hundreds of places so far removed from the previous locality of the fire that it seemed as if the havoc could only have been wrought by the torch of the destroying angel. So, and there is an ancient depiction of a destroying angel, Eon, the great Mithraic angel of igneous world destruction. So let us assume as a working hypothesis that the atmosphere was, had reached points where there was enough methane or other flammable gases in the atmosphere that it could attain combustible concentrations. Now, what is the source? Now, nobody other than Ignatius Donnelly is thinking at that time is thinking anything other than a purely terrestrial source for this concentration of, of flammable gases. But that doesn't explain how you could have such widespread <clears throat> distribution. Let's say if there is a swamp that's discharging flammable gases, and those flammable gases in the immediate area of the swamp are sufficient to uh, cause combustion. But how can we explain that over thousands of square miles? Unless, see, and here's where we get to this idea that perhaps uh, perhaps the earth had been in a phase where because of, and again, only because the existing climatological conditions were conducive to this concentration of gas. And this is why it would make sense that there was an atmospheric inversion at the time because the atmospheric inversion will hold down the denser particulate matters of smoke and dust and soot, but also presumably of the gas concentrations. In other words, if you have an incursion of gas, and here the theory is, or the hypothesis would be for testing or for consideration, is it possible that if the Earth was in the tail of a comet, or if there are regions of space within the, the orbit of a comet where enough gas could concentrate that it would accrete to the Earth and concentrate to um, levels that would be sufficient for combustion? That would be the, the question that we would be exploring. And then we did find out something very interesting, another coincidence, when we start looking at the sort of the mythical and um, you know, the, uh, 
the traditions associated with the draconid meteor shower. And this would be, I think, perhaps a uh, good fodder for one of Dave Matheson's presentations because we did uh, look at the, um, yeah, here we go. So we're going to review this. And we'll go. did that bring it up? That's it. There okay. So there you can see Draconids. Um, I mean, you can see Draco right there. It's the outline of Draco. And X marks the radiant center of the Draconid meteor shower right at the dra dragon's head. And then we saw something very interesting. Here is the constellation of Draco the dragon. And now we'll superimpose the radiant. Yeah. Then we saw the traditional depiction of Draco, and now we are going to superimpose the radiant of the Draconid meteor shower. Fire-breathing dragon. That, to me, is an interesting synchronicity of symbolism there. In fact, I would have to say it's one of the more interesting symbolical synchronicities I think I've ever seen. Yeah. How did that come to be? Is that coincidence that I just can't even, I'm having a difficult time wrapping my head around this one. But like, there it like is. Mike always says, coincidence takes planning. Who says that? Mike. He told our, us that. Our Mike? Yes. Quoting my one of my favorite uh, military analysts, yes. Malcolm Nance. There you mm -hmm. go. Coincidence takes planning. <laughs> And then I don't know, we didn't talk about this, but this is very interesting. It's been proposed that the uh, the Angkor Thom Temple Complex in Cambodia is a, is a depiction of Draco in the sky. No, we have never mentioned that. That's there cool. it is. Yeah. There's more on that. We'll have to come back to that. I haven't fully researched Angkor Thom to the point where I can really speak authoritatively about this connection but if it's true it's definitely interesting so i am going to stop the share there and then talk about a few of the uh the draconid meteor shower let's see let's go back to how about this right here? So this is from the Cloud Bait Observatory in Guffey, Colorado. And this was a bright fireball that was seen on October 7th, 2002. The bright meteor was seen by residents of Colorado, Utah, Nebraska, and New Mexico at 7.18 p.m. Its probable path has been determined based on about 300 witness reports. The meteor became visible near the Four Corners area and descended fairly steeply, breaking up near Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Tracing the path of the fireball back to its origin probably places the radiant in Canis Venatici or Ursa Major. It is also possible the radiant is in Draco which is significant because the date of this event places it during the annual Draconid meteor shower. The Draconids are noted for producing occasional large fireballs. Going back to 1997, this is, was a report that appeared in the Lunar and Planetary Science, Volume 30. The uh, title of the report is the El Paso Super Bolide of October 9th, 1997. On October 9th, 1997, a large fireball appeared near the Chihuahua, Mexico, Texas, USA border, moving northwards to detonate east of El Paso, Texas. Most residents of El Paso 
and Juarez heard the blast and many watched the resulting dust clouds. The fireball was bright enough to cast discernible shadows on this cloudless, clear day. The terminal flash was bright enough to be recorded by downward-pointing security video cameras and to be noted by persons inside curtained rooms. Witnesses working outdoors under the burst location described the landscape turning red around them. Um, and then another report, sonic blast from meteor rocks El Paso. Shortly before 1 p.m. Thursday, a series of sonic blasts rocked El Paso. El Paso police report that an acre of scorched earth 27 miles east of El Paso and 20 miles north of Hueco tanks confirmed speculation that a meteor or its remains just missed the Sun City. The sonic boom which followed the meteor's crash was heard as far away as Anthony, New Mexico and felt in El Paso. October, here was a report uh, appeared in the journal Science, uh, a report from NASA, which, occur, which appeared on October 14, 1998, the Giacobinids uh, Dazzle Observers. Sky watchers in Japan and Eastern Asia were treated to a spectacular show last week thanks to periodic comet Giacobini Zinner. The comet is about 40 days away from Earth's orbit, but tiny bits of debris from the comet arrived last Thursday. Astronomers had predicted a possible meteor storm, and many observers were not disappointed. Giacobinid outbursts have happened in the past, with hourly rates greater than 20,000 meteors. This year's outburst occurred between uh, the 13th and 14th universal time, uh, between hour 13 and hour 14 universal time, on October 8th. The meteor outburst lasted less than about two hours, so while Japan and Asia saw more than 500 per hour, observers elsewhere saw very few. So that's very interesting um, that there was a um, an outburst that had hourly rates greater than 20,000. And then uh, from the Associated Press uh, Nationwide News Service on Saturday, October 10th, 1992, a meteor showered skies over the east with glowing streaks of light Friday night, sprinkling debris near planes and prompting a deluge of telephone calls to authorities, officials said. Quote, it was just a big green ball of fire with a tail behind it, said John Law of Camden, West Virginia. The shooting lights were the Draconids, a display of meteors that pass through the Western Hemisphere every October 9th, said National Weather Service meteorologist Rich Mamrosh. Sightings were also reported in Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, Virginia, Washington, D.C., and North Carolina. And one of the fireballs here, I have a... Uh, a photograph here taken of one of the fireballs. All right. Are you guys seeing the peak skill fireball of October 9th, 1992? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yes. Yeah. Now, can we imagine that if our our previous scenario had any plausibility to it, that with the right conditions, the right climate and weather and atmospheric conditions, right conditions of pressure and so on, that we could accumulate gas sufficient. And I mean, from the eyewitness accounts, and I didn't by any, you know, I didn't read them all, but, you know, people were saying that for several days leading up to the outburst of fires, they were smelling and tasting gas. Right. Yeah. So it does appear that you had gas accumulating in the atmosphere. Well, Let's say you have gas accumulating in the atmosphere to, to concentration sufficient for combustion, and then you start bringing in some fireballs. Yeah. Boom. What a recipe. Yeah, which would themselves be made of the same stuff that made the gas in the first place, right? You probably. Just solids. Yeah. Unless I wonder, if there were, I wonder if there were indications 
before that, like birds, you know, birds dying in the forest, something like that. Wouldn't there be some kind of indication that there uh, were accumulations yeah. of gases? Yeah, that'd be there'd be animal animals mm. unable to handle it. That's why you take the canary in the coal mine, right? It, yeah, it exactly. Detect, it can detect buildup of that kind of gas when you can't, when a human can't. Yeah, the forest would be silent. The forest, and that was reported too, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that there was yeah. silence. Yeah. Well, here's a uh, here's forest a would be Mike time lapse <laughs> photograph of a the Draconid shower. Oh yeah, Beautiful. look at that. Yeah, can you imagine seeing being out one night when there's a twenty thousand meteors in an hour? Well, I'm hopeful for the end of this month. Yeah, me too. I mean. I'm hopeful that it's going to be a beautiful show and not, you know, the end of the world. But yeah, uh, what's that? Yeah, we 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 all hope it's not going to be the end of the world, <laughs> right? A couple of Tunguskas would surely change some direction, though. I probably. think it would. Yeah, well, I'm hoping it's a we get a show. So, from the book. Comet, Meteorites, and Men, published in 1973 by Peter Lancaster Brown. The Leonids are not alone in providing spectacular 20th century displays. In 1900, a comet with a period of six and a half years was discovered by the Frenchman Giacobini at Nice. When it returned in 1913, having been missed in 1906 slash 7, it was accidentally dis rediscovered by the German Zinner at Bamber. From then on, it became known as P. Giacobini Zinner, 1913-V. At its return in October 1926, the Earth crossed the comet's orbit 70 days before the comet, and some meteors were observed which were shown to have a connection with it. These were subsequently named the October Draconids. On its return in 1933, the Earth passed the junction of the orbits 80 days later than the comet. And on the 9th of October, a spectacular shower was seen which reached a peak rate of 300 to 1,000 meteors per minute. Whoa. That would be a psychedelic trip. Um. It would. And then from popular astronomy that came out in 1934, um, this report. In the early morning hours of October 9th, 1933, one of the most spectacular meteor, meteoric showers of modern times was witnessed by people in Europe. The Giacobinid shower was first noticed at about 6 Greenwich Mean Time or at about dusk for European observers. By 7 o'clock, many meteors per minute were following. Falling. The maximum rate occurred at a little after 8 p.m., when, according to an observer in Ireland, the meteors were falling as thickly as the flakes of snow in a snowstorm. Another observer in Ireland estimated that at the maximum, 100, me 100 meteors appeared in five seconds. And at Malta, from a series of five minute counts, the highest rate was estimated at 480 per minute. Um, I wonder how many of them hit the moon. I know, wow. 480 per minute. Um, well, that's eight per second. So now per from. Second. Gary W. Cronk's Comets and Meteor Showers, The Draconid History. Uh, the discovery of this meteor shower resulted from predictions by several astronomers that the periodic comet Giacobini Zinner might produce a radiant in early October. The first to make such a prediction was the Reverend M. Davidson, who in 1915 examined the periodic comets observed since 1892 to isolate any that might be capable of producing meteor showers. One of the comets which met the established criteria was Giacobini Zinner. Davidson found that the comet's orbit would be fairly close to Earth, 
on October 10th, 1915, and predicted that if the debris from this comet had spread outward by about 2 million miles, a shower might be active. The comet was next expected at perihelion at the end of 1926, and predictions for a meteor shower in October of that year were made by both Davidson and A.C.D. Cromelin. Both men gave October 10th as the expected day of maximum, and they gave similar radiance. The orbits of the comet and the Earth were found to intersect in 1926. Um, around October uh, 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 10.4, let's see, around October oh, 10th, observers in England were made aware that some unusual activity was present. What gained the attention of many observers on October 9th, 1926, was the appearance of a fireball. The event was noted by hundreds in the British Isles. The meteor moved slowly and lit up the sky. A persistent train lasted about 30 minutes, quote, during which time it underwent curious changes of form and exhibited drift among the stars. So probably the meteor then left a tail, a gaseous tail, that took a period of time to dissipate in the atmosphere. Um, G Comet G Giacobini Zinner is especially noteworthy for its system of meteors, which was first detected at its 1926 apparition. I've always, I find it interesting that the term apparition is always used for the appearance of comets, because you know what else apparition is associated with, right? Yeah, ghosts. Ghosts. Yes. In October of that year, an unexpected shower occurred when Earth crossed the comet's orbit 70 days before the comet. The shower was absent until the next comet. The comet next appeared in 1933. In that year, Earth crossed the orbit 80 days after the comet of October 9th. Um, and at one time, a shower of 300 to 1,000 meteors per minute was noted. Um, in 1946, when Earth crossed the comet's orbit only 15 days after it, a spectacular shower appeared with observed rates varying from 3,000 to 32,000 per hour. So that would be 533 per minute, or on average, yeah, about 10 per second. Damn, I'd like to see something like that. Um, Again, I have high hopes for the end of the month with uh, Schwassman, Walk, Walkman. Is that it? Schwassman. SW3. You're asking if the world's going to end, though. Most people are, right? Is this it? Is this going to escalate? <laughs> it's only going to take one big one. Yeah, it's like you're enjoying it, but. Yeah, well, if it's second, man. it could be the last second. Awesome it'll, fossil face. It'll only be the end of <laughs> <Yeah>. a world, <laughs> not right. the world, <laughs> for sure. Okay, I feel better now. <laughs> so we're we're up for a break. If you're in a yeah in betweener mode, Let's there, Randall. Sure, thought. yeah, I'm right at one last short quote here from the Origin yeah. of Comets by uh, Michael Bailey and uh, Victor Clue, Bill Napier. The guys that have been working on the, uh, you know, the 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 neo catastrophists that have been so ahead of the time um, with their understanding of the role of comets in Earth history and human history, and their, uh, you know, their work dovetailing with that of the Comet Research Group. Yeah, total pioneers. Total pioneers. Yeah. So this is from their really great book, The Origin of Comets, 1990. Periodic variations in the light curves of comets may in principle be used to obtain their rotation periods and shapes. The most unusual shape found for a nucleus is that of the periodic comet giacobini zinner which, according to Seconini, Seconina in 1985, is virtually disc-shaped, with a rotation period estimated to be about 1.66 hours. So it's spinning fast. Fast, yeah. It must be on the verge of rotational disintegration, oh, man. suggesting that the comet may be the spun-up fragment of a once 
much larger object. So yeah. we have that conservation possi- of angular momentum. That's right. Yeah. So we have this possibility that there was a much larger comet, progenitor comet, and perhaps you know its contribution to the uh, to the uh, the substances and the materials found in its orbit uh, may have been considerable. Considerable, yes. Yeah. So the idea of spinning off op- offspring is is literal, yeah. also. Yeah, exactly. It's a UFO. Yeah, it's a spinning disc. Flying saucer. Come on. Virtually disc shape. <laughs> Interesting. Spinning fast. We all knew they were coming here to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> all right you guys you're making like a serious to? subject here <laughs> Sorry, this is serious should, you guys we should take a break yeah. this is not the time for levity oh all right yeah we'll Are take a break see you in a, in a minute <laughs> okay we'll take a all break right. do it Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, before we get back into the topic, we do want to mention CBDFromTheGods.com. Please visit the website, check out their products, order something if you want to support the show and support them. And uh, they're helping Randall out, for sure. For and, sure. And share um, your yeah. stories of uh, how it's working for you. We love to hear those. Mm. Do you have something to share, Randall? Yeah, well... Uh, how to Mike Robertson uh, just sent me a CBD announcement from the gods. And um, sh- this has to do with, you've all heard of that show Shark Tank. I have I think heard I've, of it. Yes. I think I've watched it once or twice. Um, seemed like an interesting show. Anyways, there's this guy, Kevin, Kevin Harrington. He's a Shark Tank veteran. He's requested that CBD from the gods join his consortium of recommended products and distribution network. They are now officially in talks with a final outcome to be announced within two weeks. Kevin Harrington is an original shark who has shot over 175 segments of Shark Tank on ABC and updated segments for the show. Uh, and updated segments for the show. Kevin Harrington's legendary business success and his own platform building efforts earned him a seat as an original shark on the show. So we'll see what that, I guess he's vetted them and thinks that they're right at the top of the, uh, of the hierarchy, the quality hierarchy. So that's that's good. That gives us confirmation that we've been promoting a, a worthwhile product. Like investors that listen to pitches from people with new ideas or maybe patented ideas and try to start it up a business and what's their plan and, you know, are they going to put money into getting them launched? So. Yeah, he's he's getting behind CBD of the gods. That's outrageously cool. That is. Right on. Well, anything else before we get back into it? More power to him. I, I love the product. Yeah. No, I guess not. So let's just pick up the thread right. of the story and continue on. So this appeared in the Oc- Oconto County uh, Gen Web Project on the Peshtigo Fire page. Um, and so somebody's speculating here, and I think that they're speculating in the uh, in the right direction. By October 8th, now this is quoting, having smoke and smaller fires was so commonplace that it's still others no longer feared a great holocaust would come before winter snows. We've talked about that, how people living in the pine forests and so forth of the upper Great Lakes region were very used to there being widespread small fires burning continuously particularly during drought, dry periods, right? Yep. Um, but prevailing theory at this time is that the huge area around the upper Great Lakes exploded into spontaneous fire all at once because conditions were just right and many smoldering points were handy to ignite the wind-blown dryness. The many fires grew, spread, and converged to what is called the Great Peshtigo Fire. No one fire could have covered such an area in that time span 
or have grown into such a huge holocaust. But now, weather historians, using archives as a baseline and adding information from recent decades, now offer a pl plausible theory. Meteor showers in autumn are common in the upper Great Lakes. In recent years, these showers have left burning chunks scattered over the entire region, some large enough to break through the roofs of homes and outbuildings, starting fires in dry fields and wooded areas. With the tinder dry conditions present throughout the entire region on the night of October 8, 1871, such a meteor shower would easily have started what seemed like spontaneous fires in numerous places of Wisconsin, Upper and Lower Michigan, Illinois, with the continuous thick smoke from smoldering smaller blazes already blanketing, blanketing the land, making residents seek shelter inside their homes early in the evening, the meteors that entered the Earth's atmosphere could not easily be seen. Now, let's add that to the other dimension of the phenomena, the potential accumulation of combustible gases in the atmosphere. And now you bring in the burning embers. First, you accumulate the gas. Then you bring in the matches, the sparks that can ignite that gas. And interestingly, this, just as an aside, we go to Native American folklore um, about the Flintstone. And I don't mean Fred. So the flint was an object of veneration by most American Indian tribes. According to the Pawnee or origin myth, stone weapons and implements were given to man by Morning Star. Among the Kichi people of Guatemala, there is a myth that a flint fell from the sky and broke into 1,600 pieces, each of which became a god. Tohil, the god who gave them fire is still represented as flint. Perhaps something suggestive there in Native American traditions. From the morning star, falls to earth, breaks into pieces, a god of fire. Perhaps. Yeah. Yes, perhaps. And then we get to your, you guys' good friend Chandra with Rabasinga. Oh, yes. And uh, yeah, back in 2004, he, there was a, uh, a report that came out through Cardiff University entitled A Comet Strike, Surprisingly More Likely. Uh, and this is uh, quoting from the paper. Research conduct, conduct conducted by a Cardiff University astronomer scientist suggests that a comet colliding with Earth is actually more likely than was previously believed. Professor Chandra Wickramasinghe, Honorary Professor Bill Napier, and research student Janaki Wickramasinghe of Cardiff University's Center for Astrobiology believe that some comets are not visible using current astronomical scanning equipment. They argue that if this is the case, international programs designed to detect near-Earth asteroids and ways to reduce the worst effects of them colliding with Earth may need to be urgently reviewed. Professor Rick Rama Singha said, it's possible, quoting, that we are missing many of these earth-threatening objects, and we need to think again about mitigating strategies, some of which assume decades or centuries of warning before impact. The team has found that the surfaces of inactive comets, if composed of loose, fluffy organic materials like cometary meteoroids develop such small reflectivities that they appear invisible. The near-Earth objects may therefore be dominated by a population of fast, kilometers-wide bodies too dark to be seen with current surveys. That, to me, strikes me as very interesting. Perhaps that's what we're dealing with here, um, that, you know, some of these cometary masses, maybe even stemming from 
the original progenitor comet that spawned the draconids, maybe they're invisible. Yeah. And maybe Earth is encountering some of those invisible remnants more frequently. And, and invisible just because they're loosely aggregated? Extremely yes. low albedo, like they don't reflect any light. Yeah, they don't reflect any light. The team has found that the surfaces of inactivity of inactive comets, have, if composed of loose, fluffy organic material, develop such small reflectivities that they appear invisible. Okay. So I want to share a picture here of uh, a tarot deck from one of the. Um, one of the meanings of the tarot deck. Let's see if I can get this here. There it is. Temperance, 14. Uh, this is the great angel of the apocalypse and wields two powers of global destruction, fire and water. The lion and eagle in attendance represent the astronomic ages of Leo and Scorpio. Upon the angel's breast is a seven-pointed star, above which is the Tetragrammaton. We won't get into that tonight. The fourfold name of God in the Hebrew Kabbalah and the supreme formula of exogenesis. Note the seeds emanating from the head of the burning torch as it descends to earth. Overhead is the rainbow arch symbolizing the celestial covenant. So here in this card is represented the two uh, means of global destruction, flood and fire. And this is very interesting. And how this would come to be so um, appropriately represented in a tarot card that's hundreds of years old remains to be seen, and I will offer no explanation for that, other than the fact that what we were just talking about seems to almost be symbolized by this right here in the great angel's left hand. Um, and so... The black body transit across the sun back there, maybe. This? Yes. Yeah. In that, yeah, I wasn't even going to call attention to that. But um, yes, that's yeah. quite interesting. The whole card is quite interesting. And we will, in future discussions, we, we will get um, into some of this kind of symbolism because, my gosh, it's very interesting stuff. And, um, has has generally been overlooked as a source of credible scientific information for a long time. All right, so, um, so let's go into some of the um, the background on this. Um, I want to go to the uh, story of. Uh, We'll go to Phineas Eames, the story, the account of Phineas Eames, and um, because it's quite compelling. So my preface to this part is in 1996, while doing research in the Peshtigo Fire Museum in the town of Peshtigo, Wisconsin, for the TBS documentary, Fire from the Sky, I came across this letter by a Peshtigo fire survivor written to his brother one month after the fire. This account is one of the most compelling things I have ever read. In the context of everything that has been so far presented, this story puts icing on the cake. And here's the letter from survivor Phineas Eames to his brother. Dear brother, I am at home with the remnant of my family, the two oldest girls in answer to your kind letter, telling me to come with my two motherless children. I desire to give you some account of this terrible fire which we have passed through, leaving my wife, your Mary's sister, and our two youngest children behind us, gone on before us to the other shore, and why we were spared, and I, in particular, burned as I am, is more than I can tell, but God knows. Oh, the horrors of that night. No pen can portray or language express, and we who have suffered can hardly realize 
what we have passed through. Sunday, October 8th, was a cold and chilly day. The atmosphere was very remarkable, still, and filled with a dense, blinding smoke, fearfully increasing toward the night. Still, we felt no real alarm, as I was confident that if the woods were on fire and the fire approaching, I could save my family and my buildings, as we had prepared for such fires and were in a clearing of 12 acres. Through the day, I had been out in all directions looking for fire or any signs of actual fire approaching, but there was none. Therefore, on my return home towards the night, I felt no more alarmed than usual and yet could not rest on account of the dense smoke and the peculiar smell accompanying, making it very unpleasant to inhale. However, my wife and children went to bed as usual. I laid down on a lounge and was up and down through the night, watching, as had been my custom, since any talk of fires. At a quarter to ten in the evening, I was up and out in the darkness. Nothing was to be seen or heard. Hardly a leaf was stirring. But, oh, the smoke and the smell. One could hardly endure it. I feared. I knew not what. I laid down until the clock struck 11 when I was aroused by seeing lights approaching our house. I woke up wife and children and told them to dress themselves and then out to see who was coming. It proved to be my na- next door neighbor, Mr. Blavet, and his family coming over so that we might be together in case of fire, as there was more clearing around my house than theirs. By the time they had got to our house, my family were up and waiting, feeling the approach of some unseen foe. We knew not from whence or where to look for danger, and yet felt this ominous stillness, this dense smoke and stench, together with the cold and intense darkness, all combined portended something fearful, and we waited in silence its approach. Mr. Blavet and myself outside, our families inside. While standing a few feet from the door, all at once I saw a bright light approaching. Its size as large as a half bushel measure, and as it came towards us, it appeared like a ball of fire approaching from the southeast, and I saw it pass directly over my house to the northwest just high enough to clear the house. The night being so very dark, as it passed over, it dazzled our eyes, and I watched it out of sight. All in the house saw the same light as it approached and disappeared from the windows. Next, we heard a tremendous explosion, which was so great that I can compare the sound to nothing I have ever heard. The ground shook and trembled beneath our feet. The house jarred to its foundation, and the window glass rattled in their place. And while we stood in breathless silence, not knowing which way to look or turn, or from what quarter the danger was coming, for as yet we saw no fire approaching, we heard a low rumbling sound, a sullen roar like an earthquake. This lasted only a few moments, after which came a change of atmosphere with slights of puffs of wind and growing warmer every moment. Suddenly, my house took fire overhead. I remember I was out of doors in the midst of this intense darkness, and as I looked, my large barn was also on fire, the fire crawling along like a snake, a hissing flame of fire on top of the barn, on top of the house, in the tops of the trees, in the air, and yet no fire on the ground. I opened the door and came out, and we all started for the hill. You remember the ridge west of my house. We had selected this place to go to in case of fire, and from this fire we knew no better place to go. House and barn on fire, we must go somewhere. 
All this took but a moment, and we left the house, our happy home, forever, only to be united again beyond the river of death. Mr. Blavet and family, together with my children, proceeded ahead. At this time, all was instantaneously as light as day. Darkness had disappeared, and the whole heaven seemed one vast wave of fire. I took the baby out of my wife's arms, and we followed the others towards the hill. O oh God, such a scene as now presented itself cannot be described. Not only in an instant had my house and barn taken fire on their roofs, but the whole air was one bright wave of flame fire, and as yet no fire on the ground. Only later, as it caught from this shower of fire in the air, we hastened on. When about 60 feet from the house, my wife spoke. Pa, Lincoln is in the house, our only son. I placed baby in her arms, saying, You follow the rest to the hill, while I run back and see, and if he is there, I will bring him to you, dead or alive. I entered the burning house, which was all in a blaze overhead and fire falling through in every direction. So rapid had been its progress. My search was sharp and rapid, but he was not there. I ran back to where I had left my wife, supposing she had gone on, when, to my surprise, I found her standing just as I had left her. I took baby on my left arm and just then saw our boy coming towards us. He came running up to me, saying, Papa, I shall be burned up. What shall I do? I replied, Give me your hand, my boy, and we will go to the top of the hill. But don't try to get away from Papa. I saw that his terror was very great. Thus, having him by one hand and my baby on the other arm, I said to my wife, Take hold of my vest collar, as I had no coat on. She did so, but never spoke from the time she thought our boy was in the house. She was perfectly paralyzed with fear for his safety and stood gazing at the terrible fire in the heavens. I noticed as we hurried along that the wind was increasing at a fearful rate, fearful rate, great trees bending like withes before it. A few steps more, and we would have reached the top of the hill where my children and Mr. Blavet and family were. At this point, my son let go of my hand and bounded away like a deer towards his sisters. And at the same instant there came upon us, from what quarter I know not, a wave of living fire, completely enveloping us in its embrace and prostrating us all to the ground. It struck me in the face, blinding me in an instant, and my long beard and hair were in a blaze. I fell forward with my baby in my arms, all on fire, my wife falling across my feet and rolling over on her back, not a sound from her or our baby, myself in flames. The roar of the fire tornado was more than deafening. It was grand. It was like the sound of the cataract, the thunder, and the roar of the sea combined. It was fearfully sublime. I laid my baby down, drew up my feet from beneath my wife, and in the midst of this fearful rune prayed Almighty God to let me die with my family. But why had he passed me by? Take me too, I cried. I had no desire to live, for I supposed that all was gone, and that this sheet of flame had swallowed all. And in agony of spirit, I prayed to go too. But I was not allowed to die. A voice came to me so distinct and clear. I heard it. I am not mistaken, saying, Get up, get up and look for your children. I could not resist. I rose to my feet, went forward a few steps, and there at my feet lay a little form 
roasted to a crisp. I supposed it was my darling boy. Oh, my brother, I cried aloud. My senses were suspended for a moment. I knew nothing. I groped my way along. I pulled my eyes open, called my eldest girl, brave child, and she came to me in the very face of death. She came into the fire saying, Oh, where are mother and baby? But I was blind and on fire. She led me to where Mrs. Blavet's children and Mary were. Mr. Blavet and part of his family were gone. We knew not where. I said to them, we must all lay flat on our faces that we may breathe, the air being full of fire all around us. The wind had increased to a hurricane. The largest trees were bending and being uprooted before it. The roar of the wind, the blazing and falling timber, the glare of the fire, the whole heavens being one vast sheet of flame. One must see to fully know and understand the horrors of that terrible night. There is no use for me to attempt to describe it. It cannot be done. There is no danger of any pen or speech exaggerating the scenes of this fearful hour. For all of this happened in less time than I could tell it. In less than one hour, my wife and my children burned up at my side, my property all destroyed, and the ashes of my home left. And this was the foe that had come upon us. No one could guard against fire from over our heads, and we fell before it. Now the wind decreased in violence, and the force of the tempest of fire and wind had passed on. We could yet hear its terrible roar, and were in its awful trail. We now began to fully realize our condition. All of us cold, nearly naked. I fearfully burned from the top of my head, down to the soles of my feet, suffering the most intense pain. I felt that I could not endure and live. My face, one mass of burns, my hands fairly roasted, my body burned deep in many places, legs and feet fairly roasted. Can you realize what I passed through and suffered? Suffering 10,000 deaths and could not die as I had tired, desired to do with my wife and babies? I then called upon the little group, six of us in all, and said to them, Here is all that is left of our two families. We know not where your husband and the other children are. My wife, my baby, and my son are all dead. Now in this hour of sorrow, let us all, with one accord in united voices, Pray earnestly to Almighty God, our Father, as we have never done before, that we may have grace and strength to endure this terrible affliction that has come upon us, that in the fearful pain I was suffering, I might be sustained and strengthened. And as our voices mingled, ascending in prayer, all at once I felt surrounded with a host of angelic beings. They were on my right and on my left, before me and behind me. I felt their presence so clearly that I thought if I moved either way, I should touch them. And we prayed on without ceasing until in a moment, I felt my pain had left me entirely. And from that moment, I have never felt the least pain from my burns and all who were with me and have nursed me for the last 30 days can testify to my condition when with them. And I call upon my God to witness that this is the truth, and that I am this day a living demonstration of his power to heal through ministering spirits. Although, brother, you know I've never professed to be a spiritualist, neither have I been a member in the church for many years. But I know not who these beings were. I recognized none of them. It mattered little to me who they were. When they came, my pain left me. And more, they lifted from me the great weight of sorrow that weighed down my soul. They bid me to look up, not down, on those lifeless forms. They are not there in those charred and marred bodies. 
They have passed on and are now resting in the summer land above and will be with you soon. They suffered not as you think, but in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the tornado's trumpet, they were born into the immortal life. Turn now to the living. There is your duty. Mourn not for those who have passed on. You are to live and go on from here. Your brother, Phineas Eames. What do you make of that? It's what I'm calling the X factor. Yeah. Yeah. That's wow, that very was powerful. That was, yes, extremely <laughs> powerful. The first part that was interesting to me, of course, is the fire coming, you know, as he says, out of the sky. At first, there's this fireball that goes right over the top of his house. Yeah. And yeah. then I did notice also that even though they see that the fire is in the sky and setting everything on fire f- from the top down, they still try to go up to a hilltop, mm-hmm. which is where they're burned. And it just seemed, I mean, I don't know, you know, they're, they're panicking, everything's on fire, and you have this plan, like if there's if a big fire breaks out, let's go up to this rocky ridge. Mm-hmm. But the well, yeah. fire's coming down from the sky, so they're running towards it. It's, you know... Well, because, as he says, I mean, this was completely outside their experience. Absolutely, yes. It was unprecedented. Yeah. How much time do we have left? It, uh, 10, I don't 20 know. minutes. Okay. But that the, the experience that he has afterwards is like... Yeah. Um, you know, it's like the the shock and the agony and the pain, all of that stuff just kind of like allows him to go into an altered state or something. And, and I don't know, you know, experience something profound. I mean, that's just incredible what happens in that moment right yeah. after the, the crazy destruction. Like he just, he just, <laughs> I don't know what you call that. Yeah. But he, he just has this enlightenment moment in the midst of, I don't know, it reminds me of, you know, there's like, um, you know, monks and stuff, they they have a, a system for doing this. Like, you put yourself in mm-hmm. this situation that is just overwhelmingly hard and painful, and and through that, somehow you, you receive this enlightenment. But it, it, you know, he didn't do it intentionally, it just happens. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I don't, I, that's, that's just wildness. And he's not a, he's not a spiritual man. Yeah. uh, The first thing I thought of was the, the third man effect too. Yeah. Yeah. I thought of the third man. He's burnt, he's on fire and he's dying and he's wanting to die. But then he hears the voice, no, get up, you know, find your other children. It's amazing. Well, if we've got a few more minutes, let's look at one more. um, Yeah event that I categorize under the X factor. So this is from the Embers of October by Robert W. Wells, Peshtigo Historicals, published by the Peshtigo Historical Society. Now, uh, I think I'll quickly share a screen here so people can have a a context um, that they can visualize. Here we go. Okay, if we look at this map right here, you'll notice here's Lake Michigan, here's Green Bay, here's the town of Green Bay. The the events that we're now to be looking at is where this red star is. And, you know, Pe- there's Peshtigo and Marinette right there, right? So the fires actually started down in this area and spread up both the Door Peninsula and up the side of the, the western side of, the, of Green Bay. So you basically had the fires, you know, burning up both sides of the bay, but there apparently was not nearly as inhabited uh, the peninsula itself. Um, Because remember, Peshtigo was mainly a timber town. So they were, you know, bringing in all the the, the pine timber from the forests around them in this area. So let's see, here would be the next one. You can see right here, um, there's a monastery right there. And the story that you're about to hear is um, around that monastery right there i wonder if there were any boats out there at the time of this and the, and if they caught on fire 
Actually, yes, there were. Ah. There were. I don't have any of those accounts, but yeah, there were. Okay. Yes. So in terms of life back in those days for those people that were living here, you know, in the in the decades leading up to um, the great firestorms, we got um, that's what he's talking about here in this book, The Embers of October. So he says, the author says, one of the best accounts of what life was like in those days comes from Xavier Martin, who became a prominent pot- politician and real estate dealer in Green Bay. He was a young member of the first group of Belgians who set out for Wisconsin from Antwerp aboard a three-masted sailing ship in 1853. On August 15th, 1858, there occurred what Martin described as an alleged miracle, which made quite a noise at the time. A young woman, Adele Bryce, had been to Mass at the Bay Settlement. Walking home, she was in the vicinity of Robbinsville when, by her account, she saw a vision of the Virgin Mary standing between two trees. The vision addressed her, speaking in French, telling her to build a chapel on that sacred spot. According to Martin, the church authorities were skeptical and declared the apparition a myth and an imposition. When Adele refused to to cease talking about it, she was refused communion. But many of the settlers sided with Mademoiselle Bryce, and they flocked to the site. Services were held, although at first no priest would attend. Finally, the bishop permitted a small chapel to be built. This was soon followed by a boarding school, a larger chapel, a church, and a convent. Pilgrims came from miles around, and some of them claimed to have been cured of their ailments. And now here's going back to the account of Xavier Martin himself, written in 1895. Upon the 15th of August, 1858, an alleged miracle happened among the Roman Catholics of the first settlement, which made quite a noise at the time, the effect of which has not yet died out. In this settlement, within 15 miles of Green Bay, there exists a chapel and shrine built to the Virgin Mary, to which thousands of pilgrim worshipers from far and near come yearly to offer up their devotions. And if we are to believe the reports of some of the faithful, Many invalids have found a permanent cure, which is attributed by them to the virtue and powers of the Virgin. Many claim to have left their canes and crutches on the altar in the chapel, very similar to uh, Lourdes, which, you know, a similar type of vision. Um, And there's a number of these visionary events that have been documented that um, all have some kind of overlapping... um, what what was the what was the apparition or vision that they had? I, maybe I missed it. Well, the, of, the, of what she was, they were assuming is the Virgin Mary standing okay. between two so trees. It was a B, BVM, yeah. Blessed yeah. Virgin Mary. So yeah. on the okay. spot where the chapel is now built, there stood thirty-seven years ago two trees a few feet apart. Between these, it is said, appeared the Virgin Mary in person and addressed Adele Bryce, who was at that time passing on her way home from attending church in the Bay Settlement. And the Virgin spoke to her in the French language, requesting her to devote all her time to the service of the Virgin and the dissemination of the Catholic faith and to build a chapel on that sacred spot. The report of this strange apparition spread over the Belgian settlements in this and adjoining counties with lightning speeds. The people came in large numbers to see what they considered holy ground and to listen to the words of Adele. Without going into the details of the event and its result, I will simply say that for several years, this young woman met with considerable opposition from the clergy of the diocese, who publicly declared that the alleged apparition was, as I said, a myth and an imposition. For a time, even the Holy Sacrament was refused to the girl for the perseverance with which she made her assertion. However, in spite of all the opposition, the multitude would congregate on the spot and with Adele would worship and even say mass on certain days without a priest. So it, very similar to, to the way the church establishment um, re- responded to, um, you know, Bernard of, uh, Bernadette of Subaru, who, who claimed the, um, the apparition um, there in, in the, uh, at Lourdes in the P- 
here in these mountains of southern France. That's right. That's the one with the the spring. Yes. Yes. And also uh, Fatima, right? The same thing happened there. Yes. Yeah. And that would be worth looking at because that was an extraordinary of event Absolutely. that was witnessed by thousands of people. That's right. So people came. This is from the Green Bay Gazette, August 13, 1925. People came in large numbers to the quote-unquote sacred spot and to listen to Adele, who had changed from a bashful country girl, unlettered and unimposing, to a fiery preacher and teacher whose perseverance and enthusiastic obedience to the voice heard only by her won her converts at every turn. For several years, she met with opposition from the clergy who declared her alleged apparition a myth. Adele persisted to tell of the vision, and the pilgrims to the mound between the trees increased in number. Now, there's a lot of old Indian mounds in Wisconsin. So the first thing that might come to my mind is perhaps this was an artificial mound. Yeah. Finally, repeating mm. the fate of St. Joan of Arc, Adele was refused the sacraments of the church and threatened with excommunication if she persisted in her stories. But Adele's enthusiasm only increased. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit for the sake of time. Um, so, um, let's see, we'll jump ahead. Um, okay. So here we go. In the summer of 1853, 10 families from Belgium settled just east of Green Bay. They were the first in a wave of 15,000 Belgian immigrants who would soon populate the region where Brown, Door, and Kiwani counties come together. Among them was Adele Bryce, a young peasant woman who came with her parents. The Bryce family established a remote farm northwest of the village of Luxembourg, and Adele often helped carry its wheat several miles to a mill at Dixville on, on the Bay Shore. She also walked several miles to church each Sunday, and here's an interesting detail, following an Indian trail which that ran oh, to man. Bay Settlement, which yeah. would suggest to me that that might in fact have been an artificial Indian mound, which was the site of the apparition. So on the morning of Sunday, April 15th, 1858, Adele was passing through some woods in Robbinsville when she was overpowered by a vision that she later described to a nun who related it this way. There appeared between two trees, one a maple, the other a hemlock, which stood for years after a blinding white light, which paralyzed the poor girl with fear. She cowered before it and prayed rapidly and breathlessly as the light took definite form, and between the trees stood a marvelously beautiful lady clothed entirely in dazzling white garments, with no touch of color save a wide yellow sash or girdle. Her hair was auburn, her eyes deep and dark, and she bore a radiant and kindly smile. Adele trembled with fear as the vision gradually faded away. The next Sunday, she traveled the same route with companions to show them the spot. When they reached the two trees, Adele collapsed involuntarily to her knees as the vision reappeared, though her friends saw nothing unusual. When they arrived at the church, a priest advised her that if it happened again, she should ask the beatific lady why she had appeared. For the next several weeks, curious crowds followed Adele through the woods each Sunday but nothing unusual happened. And then, on October 9th, 1859, her friends saw Adele once again fall to her knees between the maple and the hemlock and ask aloud, in the name of God, who are you and what do you wish of me? So then she hears from another account, the, sister, the account of Sister Pauline LaPlante. And... Um, so this is, again, on the way to church. On the following Sunday, she had to pass here again on her, on her way to Mass at the Bay Settlement, about 11 miles from her home. This time she was not alone, but was accompanied by her sister Isabel and a neighbor woman. When they came near the trees, the same lady was at the place where Adele had seen her before. Adele was frightened and said, almost in a tone of reproach, reproach Oh, there is that lady again. Adele had not the courage to go on. The other two did not see anything, but they could tell by Adele's look that she was afraid. They waited a few moments, and Adele told them it was gone. It goes on. It had this number of um, 
apparitions enough a number of these appearances until this one of October 9th and then um so then this time uh the last two times she, she's approaching um the 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 mound with the trees as they approached the hallowed spot Adele could see the beautiful lady clothed in dazzling white with a yellow sash around her waist her dr her dress fell to her feet in graceful folds she had a crown of stars around her head, and her long wavy hair fell loosely around her shoulders. Such a heavenly light shone around her that Adele could hardly look back at her face. Overcome by the heavenly light and the beauty of her amiable visitor, Adele fell on her knees. In God's name, who are you and what do you want of me? asked Adele as she had been directed. And here I find this answer to be very significant. I am the queen of heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners. She doesn't say I'm the Virgin Mary. She says, I am the queen of heaven. Right. Yeah. That's, isn't that from like, that's from the Epic of Gilgamesh too, right? Oh yes. Yes. It, it, yes. And e Egyptian tales. Cause you know, who is the queen of heaven? Isis, Hathor. Um, okay. A little, little overlap from our live a few days ago. Uh, live. Number 10, we, you were talking about the Carrington event, right? So that was 1859 also. I don't mm -hmm. remember the dates on that, but yeah. I can't believe this other, happened some on. Some solar things mm -hmm. at some level uh, affecting that also. October 9th. Yeah. So let's go on here. Much has been written about the Great Peshtigo Fire, which claimed an estimated 2,500 lives, 10 times more than the Great Chicago Fire, which occurred on the same day. Our intent here, however, is to show how this tragedy played an important role in the events which occurred at Robbinsville. On October 9th, 1859, Adele Bryce had her third vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary, I will say, the Queen of Heaven, when the Blessed Mother spoke to Adele the third time she appeared, and she warned, if they do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. Oh. We do not propose to pass judgment on the reasons for this catastrophe, but one day short of 12 years after the Robbinsville apparition, on October 8, 1871, the great calamity fell and a tragedy begat a miracle. The Belgian colony, which embraces a large part of the peninsula and included Robbinsville, was visited by the very same whirlwind of fire and wind that devastated Peshtigo. When the tornado of fire approached Robbinsville, Sister Adele and her companions were determined not to abandon the chapel. Encircled by the inferno, the sisters, the children, area farmers, and their families fled to the shrine for protection. The statue of Mary was raised reverently and was processed, processed around the sanctuary. When the wind and fire threatened suffocation, they turned in another direction to hope and pray, saying the rosary. Hours later, rains came in a downpour, extinguishing the fiery fury outside the chapel. The Robbinsville area was completely destroyed and desolate, except for the convent, the school, the chapel, and the five acres of land consecrated to the Virgin Mary. What? Though the fire singed the chapel fence, it had not entered the chapel ground. What's more, the only li livestock to survive the fire were the cattle brought to the chapel grounds by farmers and their families who came to the shrine seeking shelter from the firestorm. The chapel well was only, even though the chapel well was only a few feet deep, it gave the cattle outside all the water they needed to survive the fire, while many deeper wells in the area went dry. Hence, the chapel well has been sometimes referred to as the miraculous well. In the days to follow the great fire, the poor Belgian pioneers needed no more proof that Mary's visit to Sister Adele was genuine. And one more um Another suppose, this is from an old Wisconsin archive, The Miracles at Robbinsville. 
Another supposed sign of divine intervention occurred during the famous Peshtigo fire. On October 9, 1871, the anniversary of Adele's third vision, this massive fire spread through 400 square miles of northeastern Wisconsin, killing about 1,500 people. On the east side of Green Bay, it rapidly spread through the Belgian region. While others fled toward the lake for refuge, Adele and her community called on divine power for protection. They lifted the statue of the Blessed Virgin from the chapel and carrying it above their heads, circled the building while praying for deliverance. The forest fire devastated the land all around them and spread right up to the fence surrounding their enclave, but did not leap over it. Their wooden school and church stood out like an island in the charred landscape. Did they build that on the site of the apparition? Is that where it was built? Yes. Okay, yes. so the mound was there, somewhere yes. beneath them. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah. man. Definite X factor. <laughs> and I'll do a little, let's see if I can get this here. Yeah, I think we got we to gotta wrap it up here. But man, this yep. has been amazing. Yeah, I'm resisting putting the hat on. Yeah. There it is. I see it. Robbinsville Chapel today. Yep, there it is right there. It was here that Sister Adele Bryce saw visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary in 1859. Um, so, yeah, we've got actually a few more things to cover to really put the icing on this cake and bring it home. Okay. So I don't think it'll take up an entire um, episode, but we'll do the final uh, afterward thoughts. All right. In the next episode. Excellent. And we'll we'll reach back. We'll go all the way back to ancient Egypt, and then we'll come forward to our own times within the last few years. Okay. So. Wow. Fantastic. Fascinating stuff. Thank yes. you so much. Excellent show. Randall. Riveting again. Yep. So, wow. RandallCarlson.com. Check it out there. Sign up for the newsletter. Um, there's lots of ways to contact us or the team through the website. Also, contact at thecabin.com if you're interested in any of the tours. And I think we're going to do a middle, another Middle Cumberland tour this year at the end mm -hmm. of the year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also, I think um, How To Mike has got my 16 hours of lectures at the Sedona Conference, ah. almost packaged and ready. All right. And I told him to keep the price very affordable. And we talk about a number of very interesting things. It's kind of a little bit of a smorgasbord. Um, but yeah, I'll get into talking more about, um, the project, the sanctuary project yes, and some other interesting stuff. So check that out, randallcarlson.com or howtube.com, and it should be available within a few days. So clearly we need to build it in a place where we see the, the queen of heaven. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's the property we need to get. That's the property <laughs> we need to get. That's <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll next episode we'll get we're going to get more into the Queen of Heaven. Okay, fantastic. Because, okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right. All right, guys. Anything else, Brad? That you can think of? No, I think we may add some little details in here as this comes out because I'm a little bit behind after being on tour for a while. So okay. yeah, we'll have some uh, more thorough announcements about the what Randall just mentioned, uh, partitioning out the. The, the two weekends uh, into just Randall speeches and lectures, um, just the day with Randall Graham, George, and uh, Alan West. Uh, yeah, or, or just Sean Webb. Yeah, there, there'll be different options there to buy the whole okay. weekend or to just buy a particular speaker or a particular day. So those, those details are still being developed, and we'll have that soon, hopefully by the time this comes out in two and a half, three weeks. So All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Easter Sunday. If 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 people want to get a really condensed, multi-perspective understanding of the whole Younger Dryas, you could do no better than getting that Easter Sunday with myself, with Graham, with yeah. George Howard, and Alan West. Those were great Absolutely. presentations. Yeah. Yeah, it was an incredible Absolutely. day. All right, guys. All right, guys. Really yeah. good to see you all again. You too. All right. I Till yep. next time. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Thanks, Brad. Not hearing you, Mike. But we Come love on, you. Mike. Yeah. All right, y'all. Good night. Ciao.